Welcome everyone. Welcome to the last webinar of the autumn session of the Identity on the Line uh, project. Uh, welcome to Professor Pamela Bellinger, who is going to be our lecturer for today. Uh, first, uh, for the newcomers, I will quickly and shortly present you the project that we are discussing within the webinars. It's the Identity on the Line project. Um, it's a project discussing migrations, a large-scale cooperation project between six cultural institutions, museums and universities, working together to explore a long-term consequences of different migration processes. They are forced, voluntary, which took uh, place in Europe in the last uh, 100 years. Through the collection and dissemination of experiences from former migrants and their um, decessors, summarized and placed in factual historical context, we will try to um, discuss uh, migration from past to the future. We will try to build new narratives. Um, we will have some exhibitions. And uh, what we really want to discuss with all of you is what is the heritage of migration and who are the migrants today? Um, I welcome and I'm really honored to welcome Professor Pamela Bellinger. Um, she's a professor of history and Fred Cani chair in the history of human rights at the University of Michigan. She holds degrees uh, from the University of Stanford, Cambridge, John Hopkins, in history, uh, social anthropology, and anthropology. And she is the author of many amazing books and articles, but especially I have to show because um, I'm a huge fan of two books. One is uh, Mem History in Exile, Memory and Identity in the Borders of the Balkans. And the other one, the new one, the newcomer is this one. Uh, it's, um, the World Refugees Maze, the Colonization and the Foundation of Post-War uh, Italy. It's a new book, it's a fresh one. Uh, Paola is going to talk about this book, but actually she's also going to discuss uh, the research that she has also done within this book. Um, Pamela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us and for sharing all your research and your thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kaya, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak with everyone today and in a very small way to participate um, in the Identity on the Line project. Uh, as you've said, uh, this project aims to reinforce the sense of belonging to a common European space, I'm taking the language from your website, among contemporary migrants. And you and your collaborators are doing this in part by recuperating the heritage of past migrants from refugees to so-called voluntary or economic migrants, although we know that those distinctions are often quite fuzzy in practice, um, from and to the seven, six, seven areas that are represented by the project partners. So in my comments today, I'm going to focus on population movements out of the Eastern Peninsula after the Second World War. And this is a focus that's shared by both the Slovene and Croatian partners in the project, uh, the National Museum for Contemporary History in Slovenia and the Ethnographic Museum of Istria, uh, respectively. And I think this, these are the only partners who are sharing um, a thematic topic and that reflects the transborder reality of Istria. So in the 20th century, the Istrian Peninsula experienced three periods of dramatic regime change the dissolution of the Habsburg Empire in 1918 and Italy's formal assumption of control in 1920, the contestation by Italy and Yugoslavia over the territory at the end of World War II, with the area successively awarded to Yugoslavia by agreements in 1947 and 1954, although the latter was only ratified by treaty in 1975, and the peninsula's subsequent division between Slovenia and Croatia in 1991 with the breakup of socialist Yugoslavia. Each regime change brought about significant population movements and demographic shifts, what historian Piero Chiorini has characterized as ethnic metamorphoses. With Istria's passage to Italy in 1918-1920, German speakers from Istria and the area around Trieste migrated to the rum state of German Austria, while individuals from the Regno or the pre-1920 Kingdom of Italy arrived. 
joining already significant numbers of so-called Rengicoli who had inhabited the territory during the Habsburg period. During the 1920s and 1930s, both political and economic motives prompted flows out of Istria to the new state of the kingdom of, the, of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, as well as to the classic countries of political exile and labor migration like France and Switzerland. With the peninsula's division in the 1990s, the Croatian territory of Istria instead witnessed the influx of ref refugees, particularly from Herzegovina. But it was a decade following the Second World War that arguably brought about the greatest modern demographic change in the peninsula, as anywhere between 180,000 and 225,000 individuals departed in an extended process collectively known as the Istrian Exodus. This exodus has been largely memorialized, uh, has largely been memorialized, particularly in Italy, where roughly two thirds of the migrants resettled and formed a large network of political associations and cultural clubs in ethnicized terms as a flight by Italians out of territory rendered unlivable by its new Yugoslav socialist overlords. In its most simplified version, the explanation of a complex and temporally extended set of processes runs something like this. In the aftermath of 20 years of Italian control over the area, during which time the fascist regime pursued nationalization campaigns towards its ethnic Slovene and Croatian citizens, with the installation of Yugoslav control, Italians paid the price for, quote, the sole crime of being Italian, end quote. Central to this account are the executions Yugoslav partisans and forces carried out in 1943 and 1945 in the karstic pits known as the Foiba. In part, the violence of the Foiba and its presumed causality in provoking flight explains historians' increasing tendency to include Istria within their surveys of the 20th century forced migrations that dramatically reconfigured Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe. As Dr. Lydia Nikolcevic makes clear in her introductory video to the Croatian piece of the Identity on the Line project, such an account flattens and simplifies the reality of who left Istria during and after World War II and why. Not only self-ascribed Italians, but also Slovenes, Croats, East Romani, and those who felt themselves to be Istrian above all else, left for varied motivations and in distinct historical moments. Those leaving traveled pathways already well trod, and then I'm gonna share a screen, just one moment. Uh, there we go. There's always a bit of delay in this, apologies. Let's see. Uh, they followed uh, pathways already well trod by previous generations of Istrians whose trajectories and suitcases Dr. Nikolcevic and her collaborators tracked for their 2011 exhibition, Valige Destini at the Ethnographic Museum in Pazin. Because so much of the material heritage of those departing the peninsula exists only outside of Istria today, Dr. Nikolcevic and her team had to follow the roads of the diaspora to places ranging from Novara to New York to Buenos Aires to assemble both the materials and the testimonies of their histories. Writing about the materialities of migration, Leora Aslander and Tara Zara's words aptly describe the work carried out by the Ethnographic Museum with this exhibit. They say, quote, through the presentation of the banal things that immigrants, refugees, and prisoners carried with them, these exhibits remind us of how people in desperate circumstances rely on familiar things in their efforts to retain memories and maintain a sense of self. In so doing, they transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. A vase crafted from a spent artillery shell does not just hold flowers. A spoon made in a concentration camp is not merely something used to eat. And a pen carried across oceans is as important as a memory prompt as an instrument with which to write." End quote. It's on this point, the question of material traces and absences in the memorialization of the Eastern Exodus that I'd like to focus my talk today. Today there exists an extensive memorial complex around the Eastern Exodus, much of it in Italy. The centerpiece of this memorial industry came with the establishment in 2004 of a national Giorno del Ricordo, or National Memory Day of the Exiles. The date chosen to uh, remember uh, this migration is the 10th of February. And this is the date of the 1947 peace treaty with Italy that awarded the southern portion of Istria to Yugoslavia 
and whose Article 19 set out the procedure for those in ceded territories to opt for Italian citizenship or to simply become citizens of the new Yugoslav state, uh, which was Article 20. Since the creation of the Memory Day, there have opened museums in and around Trieste, notably at the former refugee camp at Padriciano, with a permanent exhibition mounted in 2005, and the Civico Museo della Civiltà Istriana, Pimana, and Dalmata inaugurated in 2015. In 2015, there also opened in Rome a house of memory, the Casa del Ricordo dell'Esodo dei Istriani, Pimani, e Dalmati. Funds have also been earmarked to display the contents of Magazzino di Ciotto, the office in Trieste Old Port for Eastern property that was made famous by the singer Simona Cristicchi's 2014 musical homage. Um, and the, this, uh, these materials are intended to be moved to another port building. I think it's Magazzino um, 26. In addition, Italy has witnessed a flurry of street and square namings to memorialize the victims of the Foiba. These joined long-standing museums such as Rome's Archivo Museo Storico di Fiume, which dates to 1963, and the National Monument created in 1992 at the Foiba of Basovica, located on the karst above Trieste. In retrospect, we might see the memorialization at Basovica as a key initial, if at the time, contested step in the creation of what today exists as a fairly robust national Italian memory regime around the Exodus and the Foiba. I first arrived in the region as a young uh, and unformed doctoral student in anthropology just a few months before the declaration of Basovica as a national monument. Indeed, I visited the Basovica site and the marker to its victims in the summer of 1992 in the presence of activists from Trieste's Slovene minority who questioned claims about both the numbers and identities of its victims. A counter memory of Slovene victimhood was inscribed in the myriad memorials to Slovene anti-fascists dotting the predominantly ethnic Slovene villages on the karst that surround Basovica. While these lapidaries and markers often represented localized memories, the former Nazi fascist camp of Riziera di San Saba in Trieste, which became a national monument in 1965 and opened as a civic museum in 1975, became a key space in which Italian Slovene memories of resistance to fascism were articulated at the level of the city and the region. With the lugubrious distinction of being the only such camp on Italian territory that had an operating crematorium, the Riziera's 3,000 victims were mostly Slavic anti-fascists, and the camp served as a transit point for Jews being sent to camps in the East. Celebrations on April 25th the day to commemorate Italian liberation in World War II, have frequently seen symbolic clashes at the Riziera between individuals and groups inserting Slovene anti-fascism into a larger narrative of Italian liberation on the one hand, and those calling to remember the Foiba and arguing that in Trieste, the end of the war did not signal liberation, but rather a new occupation by the Yugoslav Fourth Army and the Slovene Ninth Corps on the other. Within the particular political context of Trieste, the Riziera's place in Holocaust memory has largely been secondary or subsidiary. The pitched contests over sites like Basovica and the Riziera provided one of my first introductions to the divided or more perhaps accurately the fractured and even lacerated memories of the Second World War and its aftermaths, particularly post-war migrations in the old Italo-Yugoslav borderlands. Trying to understand the perceptions of and politics around the Eastern Exodus led me to return to the region in 1995 and 1996 for 21 months of fieldwork conducted in Trieste and the Croatian Eastern town of Rovin or uh, Rovino. My time in the field coincided with major political and narrative shifts within Italy, as well as newly independent Slovenia and Croatia, that transformed how the events of the war and the early post-war period and the fascist era, era more generally were remembered. But in my monograph, History in Exile, I argued against the language often employed by Eastern exiles and their advocates that their history was a submerged one that had been unvoiceable or unspeakable within Italy. Rather, I argued, these stories had lost much of their mobilizational appeal at a national level after the border's resolution in 1954 with the Memorandum of Understanding. 
It was only in the 1990s with the end of the Cold War, Yugoslavia's implosion, and the new, really old, new uh, vocabularies around ethnic cleansing, that the stories and experiences nurtured within Eastern exile associations and families found a receptive national audience in Italy and even beyond. So essentially what we've witnessed in the decades uh, since I first did my doctoral work is a nationalization or national expansion of what was a regional memory complex centered in and around Trieste during the Cold War. This was in contrast to the situation across the border where the possibilities for public discourse about post, the post-war migration remained highly circumscribed during the period of Yugoslav socialism and even the first decade of independence in Tudjman's Croatia, for example. But that said, there existed and still exists notable lacunae in the stories told about the Eastern exodus within Italian public frame and the memorialization of this migration. One difficult note has been around questions of sexual violence or sexual abuse as Marisa Brugna discovered when she published her memoir, Memoria Negata, and found that some of her fellow Eastrians were dismayed when she recounted being molested as a child in the camp at Marina di Carrara. For some readers, this constituted an uncomfortable airing of dirty laundry. Likewise, questions of mental illness have not figured prominently in accounts of, in accounts of the Eastrian migration, with some notable exceptions, such as Gloria Nemetz's Dopo Venuti a Trieste, Storie di Esoli Giuliano Dalmato attraverso manicomio di confine. Documenting mental illness among those who opted for Italian citizenship and moved to Trieste, Namage's study testifies to the psychological disruption that such displacement caused many individuals, one that at times was compounded by the institutional violence of the asylum. I would argue that the initial elaboration in the 1990s and early 2000s of the Eastern Memorial Complex focused primarily on the violence of the Foiba and the events of departure itself. The experiences of those who lived in refugee camps, often for long years, remained another relative silence, although this has changed with the creation of the Museum at Padriciano and other initiatives. In part, the initial focus on the departure itself from Istria reflects the inherent nature of narrative or dramatic structure accounts of exodus climax in the moment of leave taking and what follows arrival, camp, resettlement or immigration abroad is merely falling action in denouement. In addition, the camp experience was not shared by all Eastern migrants while well, departure obviously was. But the initial lack of memorial attention to the camp experience also reflected, I would argue, broader challenges. By its nature, migration and displacement refer to processes or states of transition ones that may not be necessarily legible within the logics of archival cataloging. Yet Tony Kushner has argued forcefully that historians have generally failed to take account of refugees more for ontological than for epistemological reasons. That is not because of difficulties with sources, but because of what he calls an enforced and absolute absence coming out of discrimination, exclusion, and expulsion, end quote. While seconding Kushner's verdict, regarding historians' relative lack of engagement with refugee questions until recently, Peter Gottrell, who was one of your speakers a few weeks ago, nonetheless points forward, um, ways forward that underline challenges precisely with sources. In offering solutions, Gottrell reminds us, quote, there is also a conversation to be had between historians and refugees themselves, end quote. And this is something that I've taken to heart in my own research, and that informs many of the contributions to Identity on the Line. Tracking migrants frequently requires following them through multiple archives in the moments when their tracks actually became traces. But for this reason, life histories, interviews, ethnographic participation, participant observation where possible, and the works of the displaced themselves, writings, artwork, music, and so on, become key alternatives or supplements to written sources found in conventional institutional repositories. And also the kinds of things that make for such rich and poignant museum exhibits that create a sense of identification and empathy. Because the sites of refugee camps are by nature transient, however, the literal infrastructures of many displacement hi histories were typically dismantled soon after the time of events. In post-war Italy, as in much of Europe, authorities frequently repurposed military structures, internment camps, or even concentration camps, notably the Riziera di San Saba, to house displaced persons. 
As a refugee camp, Rizieri de San Saba had a, a reputation for many hard luck cases. In 1960, the UNHCR commissioned a series of pamphlets to publicize World Refugee Year and its goal of clearing the camps in Europe. Kay Webb and Ronald Searle's Refugees 1960, a report in words and drawings, offered brief portraits of the displaced that the authors met on their visits to refugee camps in Italy, Austria, and Greece. The pamphlet included a sketch of a little girl that made it on the cover, um, encountered in the transit camp at Riziera di San Saba. Singled out by the authors for its precarious living conditions and its large population of so-called difficult to settle refugees, um, particularly those who were suffering from tuberculosis. This camp housed displaced persons who had made their way uh, to Italy from the areas of Venezia Giulia ceded to Yugoslavia, as well as from Eastern Europe more generally. But visitors to the Riziera di San Saba today will find little evidence of this history. Indeed, memorials at wartime sites repurposed after the conflict to house migrants often recalled their earlier usages, privileging wartime histories of violence over refugee stories. With the declaration of the Riziera di San Saba as a national monument in the 1960s, for example, the camp that had existed, the refugee camp that had existed there was disassembled and the Nazi camp carefully reconstructed. In the text that accompanies the, the drawing of this young girl, Webb and Searle noted the irony of this repurposing. They wrote, this child is one of many who wander about the cinder playground, which was once the floor of a gas chamber, end quote. I visited the Riziera in 2002 with a former national refugee from Pula or Pola, who had been a, similarly been a youngster on that cinder playground. This woman had not returned to the Riziera since her family immigrated to the US in 1958, and she marveled at how different the space looked, particularly as sites of sociability where she had played as a child like the dining hall had been returned to their role as wartime cells. Similarly, the notorious concentration camp at Fossoli, from which departed the train deporting Primo Levi to Auschwitz, had multiple afterlives. First at war's end as an internment camp for fascists from the Repubblica Sociale Italiana, and then as a camp for displaced persons or DPs. Fossoli first housed those DPs allied authorities deemed undesirable foreigners. This included some Jewish DPs, uh, despite the efforts of the American Jewish Joint, Joint Distribution Committee to have foreign Jews sent to camps run by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. After the Fossili camp closed in 1953 with the dispersal of so-called hard to settle or hardcore refugees to camps at Frascate, Fraschette and Farfasabina, a settlement for refugees from the Eastern Adriatic was created. In 2011, after years of lobbying, former refugees from Eastern Dalmatia succeeded in having a small plaque placed within the confines of the camp to acknowledge their experiences at the nearby Villaggio San Marco that was created for them. Nonetheless, Fossoli remains best known for its role as a Nazi camp, underscoring the tendency to privilege particular experiences in sites that are actually palimpsests of traumatic histories. So for those of you in the audience who work in the world of museums and public history, you know all too well that the challenge is to, is to find ways to make physical sites speak to these multiple histories. Otherwise, the danger is silencing on the one hand, or the kind of debates that make suffering a zero-sum game, what in history and exile I deem the politics of exclusive victimhood, or what Michael Rothberg calls, quote, competitive memory, a zero-sum struggle over scarce resources, end quote, on the other hand. My more recent work on Italian decolonization reflects another exclusion from the Eastern Memorial Complex that first surprised me during my fieldwork in the 90s. Individuals with whom I worked would sometimes make offhanded comments about living in refugee camps. I'm going to stop this share. Um, uh, refugee camps with people who'd come from other territories that Italy lost with the defeat of fascism. The African colonies of Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia, Libya, and the Dodecanese Islands. Some of these camp neighbors then became actual permanent neighbors, particularly in areas like that of Rome's Aeor, where those in the Villaggio Giuliano Dalmata created for former refugees often lived alongside Italians who had been repatriated from Africa. During my time in Trieste, I met a young student whose grandparents had left Rhodes after the war, and she quizzed me on whether I'd ever found information about those departures. She had actually hoped to write her undergrad thesis on the subject, but was discouraged by lack of sources. 
And I found almost no traces of such shared experience between, uh, between Italians from the Eastern Adriatic and the former Italian empire in the various memorializations to the Exodus, despite the fact that it figured sometimes in individual memories. And this was puzzling to me to some degree in light of the choice of the date of 10th of February for the Giorno del Ricordo, because this marks the date of the 1947 peace treaty that not only ceded a large swath of Southern Istria and the city of Zadar or Zara to Yugoslavia, but also renounced Italy's rights to its African colonies as well as the Dodecanese Islands in Albania. In addition, the treaty's article 19 outlined a citizenship option, not just for those who have been domiciled in the Eastern Adriatic territories on or before Italy's entry into World War II, and who could satisfy the criteria of Italian as customary language, but also for individuals in the Dodecanese Islands. Nonetheless, the Journal del Ricordo exclusively commemorates the experiences of Italian exiles from its Adriatic lands. And these exclusions prompted me to explore the connections between migrations and migrants out of Italy's ex-possessions, asking whether it made sense to analyze these experiences in a common or unified framework. Now, when I first floated this idea with colleagues in Italy and Istria and with some of my Istrian informants, I was cautioned. Stai attenta, queste sono ben, esperienze ben diverse. These are very different experiences, people would tell me. And clearly there was some peril in crossing and challenging the usual area study boundaries, which tend to locate modern Istria in a regional central or um, East European historical frame that emphasizes Italian and Slavic nationalisms, regional rivalries and ethnic unmixings. Time and again, I was reminded that the experiences of autochthonous Italians from areas directly incorporated into the Italian state had nothing or very little in common with those of, for example, Italian settlers in Africa. And there were questions also even about the appropriateness of employing a common frame for what was known as overseas Italy, given that Italy's empire proper was comprised of territories that had a very diverse range of statuses. So there were formal, formal colonies, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. There were departments, Libya and the Dodecanese Islands, and protectorates, Albania. The different legal statuses of these possessions reflected the racial hierarchies of the empire. And these hierarchies were also expressed in the differential possibilities for citizenship and legal belonging for local populations, which ranged from colonial subjecthood to demi-citizenship in the form of special uh, Aegean and Libyan citizenships, which accorded some but not full rights. In places like Albania and the Dodecanese Islands, there was no prohibition on mixed unions, and children of these relationships became uh, Italian citizens, but this was in stark contrast to the situation of mixed race children in Italian East Africa. But despite these critical differences, both within overseas Italy and between Italian imperial possessions and the former Habsburg territories joined to Italy after World War I, recent scholarship like that of Mark Choate and Roberta Perger has evidenced the deep and intertwined history of understandings of and policies towards the populations of the irredentist territories and the formal colonies. And even more significantly for my story, the mass migration of Italians out of all of these territories followed as a consequence of the military collapse of fascist Italy and the subsequent loss of formal sovereignty over these territories after the war. Those who migrated from the former possessions to the Italian peninsula and claimed status as Italians were accorded rights as what came to be known as national refugees. Thus, even if the histories of Italians in territories like Libya or Istria were quite different, these populations did have common experiences forged in the process of migration out of these former Italian lands. And they shared a common juridical status and found assistance from the same parastatal and state entities in Italy, uh, chief among them the Alto Commissariato Profughi, Ministero dell'Assistenza Postbellica, and later the Opera per Assistenza ai Profughi Giuliani Dalmati Rimpatriati. As national refugees, these populations were set off and viewed as distinct from foreign, or international bona fide refugees who became the responsibility of the relevant UN agencies. So United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, then the International Refugee Organization, and later UNHCR. A significant portion of my recent book, The World Refugees Made, tells the messy story of how what today may appear to be a common sense legal distinction between foreign refugees and national refugees, or what we usually today call internally displaced persons, 
with the former eligible for assistance from intergovernmental agencies and the latter the responsibility of their home governments, was only worked out through painstaking debates and often ad hoc decision making on eligibility for particular cases. And of course, these classifications continue to shape how we think about migration and displacement, including the reification of the voluntary forced migration distinction. Scholarly work has rarely put the experiences of such national refugees together with those who were accorded refugee status at the international level. But in the early post-war period, the Italian peninsula served as a critical laboratory in which these categorical distinctions were not only worked out in practice, but also challenged sometimes by the displaced themselves and refined as they were consolidated in the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees. Thus, at critical moments in the early post-war period, the regimes of juridical classification and assistance established to manage the displaced in Italy, foreign and national, intersected and overlapped. While in theory, for example, the Italian state ran camps for its nationals displaced from the lost territories in Africa and the Balkans, and the intergovernmental UN agencies maintained eligible foreign refugees in IRO and then later UNHCR camps, in practice, Italian national refugees often lived alongside foreigners in camps like that at the Rizieta di San Saba. The cinder blocks at the Rizieta di San Saba became a literal meeting point of Italy's national refugees and foreign displaced persons, revealing how in practice two populations and histories often treated as running in parallel actually converged in time and space. In this intersection, San Saba did not prove unique. The camp for displaced persons constructed on the sets of Rome's Cinecitta similarly hosted both foreign and Italian refugees, although the camp was spatially divided with allied military government assisting the foreigners and the Italian state its own citizens. Marco Bertozzi's 2012 film, I Profughi di Cinecitta, focuses on the Italian national refugees who made their temporary home in Cinecitta. Here, Eastrians lived alongside Italians from Libya some of them young people who actually rejoined their families in Libya, departing from Cinecitta for Tripoli. Likewise, when in 2011, I interviewed former Italian settlers from Cyrenaica in Libya, who had spent time in the camp at the former military barrack at Aversa, which is in Campania, prior to their resettlement in a specially created village um, known as Jebelia near Anzio, one man mentioned living cheek to jowl with Eastrian Julian Dalmatian refugees. We all knew each other from the camp, he laughed, before noting the multicultural nature of Aversa. Thus, while there did exist camps specifically designated for Eastrians, we see in other settings the intermixture of Italians from the different territories that Italy lost. And this reflected, as I've noted, the commonalities of life and status as a profugo nazionale, receiving assistance primarily from Italian authorities. But in some camps that were intended for foreign refugees, like Rizieta di San Saba, one also found individuals who might otherwise have been considered national refugees, like the woman with whom I visited the Rizieta in 2002, who was amazed by how different the place looked. These intersections of the foreign and national refugee regimes reflected the frequent categorical confusions in practice over how to classify individuals from Italy's lost territories. Time and again, even as Italians from these territories have been declared as not eligible for UN assistance, individuals wrote to the UN bodies or Italian, um, or Italian state or Vatican officials interceded with the UN to ask them to reconsider their classifications and make exceptions. This was particularly pronounced in the case of migrants from Venezia Giulia and the Dodecanese Islands who came to bear the label undetermined nationality and who the Italian government pushed IRO to accept as eligible for immigration abroad, even in cases where the migrant had opted successfully by the terms of the peace treaty and had become Italian citizens. Initially, IRO staff presumed, or at least accepted the idea that the citizenship option and its language criterion, Italian as customary language, adequately mapped onto ethno-national identity. And thus Italian speakers who opted for Italian citizenship were treated as ineligible for IRO help, right? They weren't international refugees. And initially, IRO had excluded any Italian speakers, even if they had not opted, as they were seen to be the responsibility of the Italian government. But the IRO personnel quickly ran into problems with bilingual individuals and those for whom, uh, who had Italian as customary language, but who didn't consider themselves ethnically or culturally Italian. 
As a result of these discussions over eligibility, IRO changed its policies in early 1950 and began offering assistance to individuals from Venezia Giulia who had not opted for Italian citizenship regardless of customary language. And ultimately, for refugees who belied any easy classification, IRO officials adopted this label of undetermined Venezia Giulian. Um, and this wasn't unique because UNRWA and then IRO had used the notion of undetermined nationality to denote a number of ambiguous situations, but IRO personnel noted that the Venezia Giulian situation was a particularly complicated and complex one. But the IRO could only go so far. The organization, for example, refused the demand of the Refugee Association for Venezia Giulia and Zara to award the classification of indefinite citizenship to those whose options had not been approved. In 1951 and 1952 as well, IRO revisited eligibility decisions yet again, and the mission excluded a number of refugees from Venezia Giulia who had provisional passports who had previously been included within the mandate. And this led um, a number of refugees to send letters of protest to the IRO. But these displaced persons who had liquidated their savings were waiting to immigrate, ultimately found that their indeterminacy extended not only to their ethnicity and nationality, but also to their status as international refugees. While different from that of Venezia Giulia, the situation in the Dodecanese Islands raised similar questions of indeterminacy. By October 1949, between 2000 and 3000, the documents um, give different figures, uh, uh, so-called Dodecanese refugees in Italy had filed applications for IRO assistance rather than making claims on the Italian state. The special advisor uh, on Italian affairs to the IRO inquired whether the organization would honor these requests. And initially IRO rejected this uh, request from the Italian uh, authorities, but the Italian state continued to push for some recognition of these migrants as bona fide international refugees, and they cited the Venezia Giulian case as precedent. Prince Del Drago and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs pressed the case by arguing the invalidity of the Greek law that laid out the process by which opt-ins could make their applications to Greek consular officials. In Italian eyes, approval of option requests by Greek authorities didn't actually um, constitute a recognition of the opt-in's genuine Italian identity in terms of language or sentiment. Del Drago also underlined the strain on Italian assistance budgets that created by these Dodecanese refugees, as well as the ambiguous or indeterminate citizenship statuses in the Dodecanese that had prevailed under fascism. Although IRO staff took seriously these requests from Italian representatives, they ultimately did not accept Del Drago's line of reasoning. In urging careful consideration of eligibility of individual cases rather than any kind of blanket group designations, Meyer Cohen, uh, an official in IRO, stressed that for persons from the Dodecanese, quote, the most important criteria are their citizenship and their objection to return to the Dodecanese, end quote. In contrast to the Venezia Julian case, then IRO did not reverse its initial ruling on eligibility or ineligibility of individuals from the Aegean who had opted for Italian citizenship. In both instances, however, the status of migrants from the former Italian territories troubled the seemingly straightforward divisions between national and international refugees that rested on understandings of citizenship, as well as on per persecution, which I haven't talked about, but would be happy to talk about in the questions. So here we see the fuzziness of ethnic identity, as well as the fuzziness of particularly, particular categories of displaced person or migrant. But ultimately these cases um, for Italians from the lost territories that came before the IRO were the exceptions that proved the rule. Nonetheless, the categorical blurriness was reflected in the occasional overlapping and intersection of the juridical and assistance regimes established for DPs at places like the Riziera, as I've noted. So by way of conclusion, I'd like to encourage us to think about how to represent and put into conversation the experiences of those who left Istria in the early post-1945 period with broader population flows. Most of the scholarship that does this has inserted the Istrian story into a broader framework of Central and Eastern European borderlands and shatter zones, forcibly unmixed during and after the war. In the world refugees made, I offer a different model or take. First, I consider the entangled experiences of individuals leaving Italy's former territories and their collective status as national refugees, 
And second, I trace out the dialogic, consti dialogic constitution of national and foreign refugees in the early post-war period. But what kinds of models for museum practice and public history spaces might we highlight? The 2019 excursion Storia in Viaggio, promoted by the Fossoli Foundation, offers an interesting take, giving participants a guided visit to key sites in Trieste and Istria that were linked with the Istrian exodus and tying this tightly to the history of Fossoli. Similarly, the Viziera di San Saba has planned an exhibition on the site's life as a camp for foreign DPs, although this has been postponed owing to the pandemic. These are hopeful signs, I think, of more inclusive forms of memory and memorialization that treat single sites as multivocal repositories of historical meaning and experience. So the question that I'd like to leave all of you with, especially those of you who are putting together the exhibits for the Identity on the Line project or who are describe, um, designing collaborative projects with displaced persons, is how might we begin to go from something like a Giorno del Ricordo, a day of memory, to a Giorno dei Ricordi, a day of memories, that takes account of the diversity of experience. So thank you very much. I, I will stop here and turn it over to Kaya. Thank you, Pamela. And I could not agree more about i giorni del ricordi, so all the memories uh, and all in all different places of remembrance. Uh, it's time for questions and answers. And before you, we start, uh, let me just remind you that we are recording that everything what we are recording can also be seen on our uh, web page. Uh, I will just show you briefly so you can see it here. Uh, we are step by step uploading all the webinars and there are going to be more in the, in the spring uh, seminars uh, session. Uh, you are free to use them. Uh, you are free to quote them and you are also invited to ask questions and Pamela is here with us to, to answer them. So I wish we, 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 you know, we're limited by the technology. I wish that we could have a conversation because I would love to hear what all of you um, who work in public history and museums, how you are tackling these questions. Um, but hopefully we'll see the results through the Identity on the Line project. Yeah. Especially the Croat uh, team is working on, on, on the same topics. Uh, of, yeah, we are waiting for questions. So of course I, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I love the idea of discussing, uh, when we are discussing the topic of refugees, uh, the aftermath of different war of, of clashes, the competitive memories. Uh, and especially when we are discussing history within uh, its political issue, what of course, it's going on every day of remembrance is a political day of remembrance. Um, how memories are competing and when they become important for the nation itself. So uh, we don't know for sure that we have a really strong association of uh, Ezuli, who are also politically active. But do we also have an association of the refugees or their families coming from the Dodecanese islands or other parts of the lost Italian territories. For me, when reading the book, all the stories from the, uh, from the Africa experience were completely new and um, I enjoyed them very much. Um, so, I mean, that's a great question. If you look at um, the period in, in the early post-war, especially when, in a sense, the territorial question was still open, even after 1947, because as in the book, in the book I talk about how even after Italy renounced its claims on its colonies, there were still hopes that Italy would retain some kind of special relationship or status. Um, there were different proposals floated for trusteeships. In the end, that only happened with Somalia, um, which became a UN trusteeship that the Italians administered uh, for a decade. But during that time period, there was very intense lobbying, um, first at the, you know, the peace conference in 46, but then even after that. And so you have many, many um, associations, uh, Profugi dell'Africa. I mean, I, I found lots of traces of them in the archives, but not a lot of um, uh, kind of not a deep or dense archival tract um, to suggest that there were many kind of ephemeral associations uh, that probably disappeared 
um, in the late 1940s or late, late 1950s. And that's also true with the Eastrian case too. I mean, we have um, many associations now. Some, of course, are uh, recent, you know, in the last 20 years with this renewal of interest or second and third generation uh, rediscovering their roots. Um, but there were many of these kind of small associations, clubs, I mean, it's hard sometimes to judge by, let's say, the pamphlet that they produced um, that probably had a fairly short lifespan. Um, there are different associations still of the Rimpatriati from, uh, from Africa. Uh, there, there are some small groups from Rhodes and so on. They don't have the, um, the density and the political weight of the Eastrian Dalmatian human associations. I think part of that is because uh, the the Eastrian story. I mean, this was the most concentrated of all the of all the population flows. The fact that so many people migrated just across the borders to Trieste um, also led to a kind of political weight and gravity of these associations. Um, but there are different associations, um, and they're a mixture. You know, some of them are really kind of cultural associations. Some are very small local um, kind of clubs. So I mentioned this, this resettlement village at An near Ancio. Um, this was created especially for people in the 1950s for people coming from Cyrenaica in Libya. Um, so when I went to visit people there, they had a small clubhouse and they were really in the process of recuperating their own heritage um, and history. But it was something that was very much, I think, for themselves and not necessarily a kind of political um, uh, association. But there are different attempts um, and have been different attempts over the years, over the decades of, for example, the repatriates to work with um, the Eastern groups to advance what they see as their collective interest. There's always a bit of tension there because the Eastern story is different in very important ways, but also um, I think there's the Easterns, they don't, I mean, it's not a story of decolonization. And so it's a kind of complicated question of how I put that together with the decolonization story. But I think that there's also a desire um, of Eastern groups to really emphasize their specificity and, and to not make too much common cause with the people who came from, uh, from Africa and so on. Um, so it's about, there, I mean, especially in earlier periods, there was that kind of competition, I think, between the groups for resources um, and competition over memory. Yeah. And we go directly to the question that Dominic posed. Uh, shall I read it, Pamela? Yeah, I, it's easier than I am. I don't have the chat open. Okay. In Istvan Dick's latest book, Europe on Trial, he says that if there was one European project, it was one of ethnic cleansing. Your new book seems to bring Italian refugee history in line with much of what we know about post-German, British, French, Russian, etc. refugee questions. Is the bigger part of your argument that the word the refugees made is a Europe in and out and of itself, instead of a continent of nations? Is it a continent of refugees? Or maybe, Dominic adds, is it a Europe where refugees were unmade? Thank you, Dominique, for the question. That's wonderful. Yes, I, and uh, I hope I can keep a record of these, right? The written questions, because I, I would really like to ponder that. I like your phrasing, Dominique. Um, I, to be honest, um, when I was thinking about the world that refugees made, I mean, I was in part thinking of Europe, um, but thinking more in terms of the decolonization piece of the story and the ways in which the you know, Europe, European powers in general, like, are turning away from imperial identities in, um, in especially the 50s and 60s with the rise of a European common project and how these refugees from these lost territories trouble that story for Italy, but also have to be reclaimed. They have to be put into a national and then by extension, a European um, frame. So perhaps some of that is the unmaking of the refugees that you're referring to. Um, in chapter five, I talk about the, the ways that the, the refugees have to be reclaimed from 
imperialism, from fascism, um, but at the same time, they're important agents of reclamation for um, Italy. So I was thinking primarily about the world that they made in terms of post-war Italy, um, post-fascist Italy, uh, Europe in terms of the common European project, um, but then also thinking about the, the international refugee regime as part of the world that they made, um, these complicated debates. But I, um, I really like your phrasing of the question. I'm gonna think about it more. Um, I would say that, you know, when I think about say the German case, where there's a lot of similarities between the German expellees and the Italians because these are explicitly, um, you know, excluded from the remit of uh, the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees. And, you know, there's lots of work about how Eurocentric the Geneva Convention is, which is absolutely true. But the fact is that it also excluded a lot of European displaced persons from recognition as well. And I think that's one of the things that comes out in these stories. But the colonization or decolonization piece, um, I think, is distinct here um, in the Italian story as opposed to the, the German story. Um, and, and it helps us to see, I think, different things about, for example, the refugee regime that consolidates in the 1950s, right? I mean, there's still a strong commitment of most European powers to colonialism at that, at, at that point with the convention. And that's part of the hesitancy to include, I mean, there's lots of refugees of decolonization already by that point coming from um, uh, in various parts outside of Europe, right? And they're not in the remit um, of the convention until it's, it's universalized, quote unquote, with the 1967 protocol. But, but thank you, Dominic. I'm going to think more and, you know, um, about how I might continue to, to, to get purchased from this notion of the world refugees made. You already touched the next question with your answer. So Miriam is asking if you see any similarities between the treatment of Italian national refugees and the German expellees by IRO, who also were non eligible for any assistance. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, certainly, um, I mean, there's a whole series of, of categories that are problematic for the IRO. So. Um, the, the German expellees, uh, the, the so-called Balts, these um, different Baltic uh, displaced persons, um, the Italians, and they, the IRO spends a lot of time working through these questions. Um, and that's why, as I say, it's, it's so messy and complicated. Um, but there are also these interesting debates within IRO about like the very notion of Volksdeutsch. Um, so uh, I remember again, in, in context, in the context of the Venezia Julians, but some officials in IRO saying, well, these are like um, the Volksdeutsch and so on. And then other officials within IRO responding saying, well, that's a very problematic category to begin with, right? It has this racialized history. Um, it, we shouldn't actually be transferring that kind of understanding or conceptualization on to the Italians. Uh, from Venezia Giulia, for example. So, I mean, I'm going a bit beyond Miriam's question in terms of the similarities, but certainly there was a conversation within IRO, right, that was thinking about these different kinds of cases in relation to one another. Um, and, I mean, you really do see because IRO had this model of individual eligibility, although they're still talking about these categories like Volksdeutsch and Venezia Julians, um, it's incredibly time intensive uh, for them to try to work through these these questions. Yeah, Miriam is also adding th that it looks like that this history is completely denied in the contemporary discourse of refugees coming from Europe. Like the continent has never seen refugees before. What's mm -hmm. your opinion about it? Um, if I may add, we have in a project the, the history and research part, which is about the Italian refugees. But at the same time, we have the Polish part from uh, our partner, who is a museum in Slupsk near, near Gdansk, who is actually very much in parallel. But when we are listening to the stories on one side and the other, they, from the perspective of 2020, they completely differ what we know and what we don't know about the refugees who were forced to leave the territory. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, those are both great comments and questions from, from you, Kaya and, and Miriam. Um, I would say that um, in terms of, I mean, there is a kind of, uh, this narrative, I mean, certainly for Italy, this was another one of my starting points. I would get so frustrated when people would say, well, Italy was an emigrant nation, which it was, um, and it only becomes an immigrant nation, say, starting in the 70s, right? That Italy um, was always exporting its labor and its people and didn't really have this experience of dealing with others, which is absolutely untrue. I mean, on the one hand, of course, there's the whole imperial experience, um, which is a complicated story of of othering and the rise of racial anthropology within Italy and so on. Um, but I mean, certainly there were different flows of people, uh, displaced persons and migrants into Italy in the 19th century. Um, but this story of the early post-war period, I mean, Italy was home, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but to many, many foreign displaced persons, right? Throughout the 1950s into the 1960s. Um, and then the story of its own refugees. I mean, I, I think this was a major encounter with refugees. And I think um, when we, a lot of times people talk about Italy, they, they make the analogy that the Italians who, uh, who went abroad and faced persecution and stigma in the 19th century and early 20th century, right, that these are like the refugees today, quando noi eravamo gli albanese, when we were the Albanians or, you know, but there's this kind of telescoping, it's really an, an analogy. And I don't think it's an analogy, there's a direct connection. And that is the story of the early post-war period um, that connects the, you know, mass emigration of Italians and um, the emergencies of today with migration. And I say that because what emerges, one of the things that emerges in, in the story that I tell in, in the book is that also Italian officials continue to insist that they could not become a permanent home for um, foreign refugees because they had their own refugees to deal with. And I think that was certainly true in the immediate aftermath of the war. But you know, by the, the late 1950s, UNHCR is pushing Italy to allow permanent resettlement, um, you know, some of these hard to settle, hardcore refugees who are languishing in camps in Italy. Um, and Italy keeps saying, no, you know, we have excess population, we have our own uh, refugees to deal with, even though by that point, you know, Italy is in the midst of the economic boom and so on. And the difficulties to become a naturalized Italian citizen, which are, you know, persist today. Um, I mean, there there is a real, um, unwillingness to allow foreign refugees to resettle permanently in Italy um, in the post-war period. And I think we see that carrying through in juridical terms and social and cultural terms to the response to migrants today and to, to refugees in Italy today. Um, that, I mean, it's, it's interesting, um, the Museum for Italian Immigration, which was opened in Rome for the 150th anniversary of um, Italian unification. Um, it was right in the center of Rome at the typewriter or the wedding cake monument. It's now a virtual museum. I think it's supposed to reopen in Genoa as, a, as an actual museum. But it was very controversial because all the rooms were about Italian emigration. And then the last room or last two rooms were about migrants to Italy and saying, you know, we need to put these experiences together. And there was a lot of criticism of the museum for that. And I think that's, if I've understood correctly, that's part of why it's taken so long for it to find a permanent home. So, sorry, that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> no, great. Um, and we come to the question of Tamara, which is, she wants to know more about the perception of your work, of your books among the Istrians, mostly Italians, who left Istria, so the Esuli and the ones who remained in Rimasti? Um, I mean, I don't know that I, this sounds ironic that I'm the best person to ask. Um, I think certainly, um, you know, some, especially a history in exile, um, I, I write in that book about how uncomfortable I was at times because each group that I came into contact with 
saw me as their advocate, right? They thought that I was going to be the instrument to tell their story, which I mean, I was, but I wasn't necessarily always telling the story in the way that they would have um, liked, right? Because I had to put uh, a critical analysis and I was also putting the experiences of people who left and people who stayed in Istria uh, together. Um, I think, you know, at the time that I did the work, I think that the relationship, the kind of formal relationship between the so-called Ezuli and Ramasti was more fraught than it is today. A lot has changed um, uh, for the better. And, um, but I'm, I'm sure that, I, I'm sure that history in exile um, was, was not what many of my interlocutors were hoping for. But I mean, I will say, um, you know, I've been invited to events uh, in the, the Eastern diaspora in New York, for example, to talk about my work. So, I mean, I was given a very kind welcome um, by the clubs in Astoria, for example. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's more things I could say probably, but and yeah. Uh this is my question for for uh, for the end. What about this book? Do you know already what's the reception in Italy or? No, I mean, unfortunately, the book. So the book came out on March fifteenth, so it was locked down, and I knew the Ides of March was not a good day, right? It's never a good day. Uh, so I'm very grateful to the chance, like, to talk about the book with you here because you know many of the events that were planned around it had to be canceled, um, and you know my hopes to go to Italy uh, in, as well as Istria and so on in, in the summer and to bring people the book and to talk about it didn't happen. So um, I have, uh, you know, I don't think there's any reviews of it yet. Please, someone, if, if you want to write a review, I'm sure the press would happily supply you with a copy. But um, I'm grateful for these opportunities now because it's a bit belated, um, the, the, the arrival of, of the book. Um, but I hope it will be, you know, stimulating. Um, and it does, I think, have multiple kinds of audiences. So for me, the challenge is to to, to reach out to those different sorts of audiences, people in decolonization studies, refugee studies, Istria, yeah. and so on. It's a great book because it's discussing the past from the perception of the present. And I love the part when you are discussing Libya and how the refugees are coming nowadays from Libya to Italy, but that actually some decades ago, it was vice versa. So people were moving on the other side. Right. Uh, so we a part of our project that actually migrations have a long standing history and it's not something that happened right it's happening right now but actually it was happening centuries ago and it's going to happen century it's more in uh, further away in in, in time so uh, read it <laughs> <laughs> thank you um if Someone also has a question. We are still here for the last question. If not, we will finish. May, may I just add, Kaya, to yeah. what you said too, that um, the point in the book about the story of, the, of Italians going to Libya, it's not just that they were going, you know, that they went as settlers, obviously they did under, um, under fascism, but, and before that, since uh, Libya was part of Italy after 1912, but, um, the story that I'm telling there is about Italians who had been displaced out of Libya during the war and wanted to get back to Libya and Libya was under a British military administration that was a placeholder power and they didn't want Italians to return and to antagonize local populations or to influence the peace treaty discussions. So these were mostly young people who were being smuggled on boats out of Sicily, being landed in Tripoli and then um, on the coast near Tripoli. And if they were intercepted by the British, they were deported. So I think that's the particular kind of irony when we think about um, you know, the current uh, moment, right? Is that the Italians were not just migrants, but in that instance, they were the clandestini, um, you know, and, but I don't, I, I think this is a question for all of us and especially for you and your collaborators is what do we do with those history? I mean, just saying that alone doesn't necessarily create the kind of identification or empathy, right? So how, 
how might in a museum um, or public history project, how might those histories somehow inform different kinds of responses to the experiences of so-called clandestini today, right? And that's the challenge I think for all of us because just recuperating the history is only the first step. Yeah, I could not agree more. So um, we will finish here. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, don't forget that at the end, when you are going to leave the webinar, there is a survey. Please do the survey. We need it for the project. Um, thank you again, Pamela, and see you for the spring session of uh, our webinars within the project Identity on the Line. Thank you so much. Thank you.